Continuous PHP pipeline. Uh, first of all, a great uh, welcome uh, for uh, the people who have uh, uh, invited us here. They've done a tremendous job getting this thing on the road. Uh, so thank you. Basically, what they did is similar to what I'm going to talk about. They put everything in place and then added the pieces all together. So who am I? Uh, my name is Michelangelo Van Dam. I'm a PHP consultant community leader and I also train development teams on PHP stuff. Um, but this talk is more about what we're going to do today. First look at the development processes. Uh, then we're going to take these development processes and take automation first. Uh, automation first cannot be applied when you don't have continuous integration. And then for the continuous integration, we use a pipeline to spread everything out. Because the focus is that you do what you do best, uh, which is coding. And then let's summarize everything. All right? So what is PHP? I guess everyone in this room already knows what it is. Um, people are not familiar with the term SEM? No? no? OK. Uh, version control system, uh, Git, uh, subversion, those kind of things. But um, after uh, the sessions of uh, today, anyone not familiar with unit testing? Oh, OK. Yeah, you will have uh, some uh, nice uh, things coming up. Um, distributed systems. Is, uh, who's working with distributed systems nowadays? Ooh, I was expecting a little bit more than that. Um, OK, let's have a look at provisioning then. And then um, with all the version control systems, who is uh, in charge of um, uh, merging code and comes up with merge conflicts? OK, that's a whole lot more. So OK, we're in for a treat. Um, at least you are familiar with all these terms, so uh, this is going to be a smooth ride. Um, development management. Development management is something we need, something we use, something we do, um, because otherwise we cannot have projects. And the most known, the most applied is the waterfall process. So you start off with a project, and you have your kickoff meeting, you define the approaches. Um, of course, this is all execs that are operational. Um, then uh, the project uh, gets started. You have business cases, bus uh, project control, risk definitions, and it goes all the way through project control and project delivery. But in the meantime, you still have to support everything else that's going on. So there's a lot of things that you need to uh, comply. Um, who still works with the waterfall? OK, I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Um, and another process is Scrum. Uh, more people using Scrum? OK, so this is all familiar to you. So you have the backlog, then you uh, acceptance criteria, the sprint, then the sprint is in execution. You have your weekly backlog reviews and your daily stand-ups. The prototype comes out, and then, of course, the delivery. Um, let's be honest. The companies that I work for, they say we do waterfall or we do scrum, basically end up doing this. Who recognizes this? <laughs> I thought so. I thought so, yeah. So. Um, the, basically, you have project requirements, you have uh, task assignments, ad hoc issues uh, come, and uh, everything is delivered. And this is a continuum, and you never have enough time, uh, there's always stress, and, and so on and so on. But the key thing that we want to take out here is the delivery. So all these uh, procedures that you can have for managing your project have one thing in common, that is the delivery. And that is what we're going to look for in this session. The delivery is often an event. It requires off-hours planning, set up maintenance page, 
pre-release actions, uh, re release checklist, and, and so on and so on. So it actually is every single time the same procedure. But it's also an event because you have to manually verify everything is working, old and new. And if you're lucky, you are home before midnight. At least in our cases, it was often way beyond the midnight. And I don't like that. It should not be an event. It should be something that we as developers don't even have to worry about. Of course, we can have someone in the team that's involved for all doing this, but there's something more easy. Because for me, that was a nightmare. And for a lot of people, it still is a nightmare. So let's look at the automation parts first. So the saying is, computers are great at doing re repetitive tasks very well. And yes, they are. They do things in repetition over and over and over again, so you don't have to worry about things. And then we look at our configuration, our setup. Well, we have development, we have infrastructure, and we have our platform. And depending on what kind of project you're working on, what kind of application you're working on, it might have less or more components in that configuration. Let's look at infrastructure. So commonly you have three things, and I'm not talking about embedded systems, uh, for running your applications, which is bare metal, virtual machines, and cloud. It can be on-premise, it can be hosted somewhere, or you have a cloud provider uh, like uh, Azure, Amazon, or uh, yeah, the Bluemix DigitalOcean. So you have these, these providers, and they offer yeah, you, the services that you require. With hosting, uh, most of the time, uh, you need to set up your configuration, your environment yourself, you uh, need to Either depending on the, the, the license you have, either you have to maintain it or they maintain the platform. Uh, security updates, platform updates, those kind of things. Um, On-premise, it's the same thing. Cloud providers, uh, depending on which cloud provider, they offer you a box and you put on that box whatever you want. Either it's a platform that you use from them or you use uh, your own infrastructure. And when we're talking about applications, we're not talking about a simple architecture. We talk about a more, yeah, more abstracted uh, ap application where you have a lot of proxies, a web uh, server, multiple DB slaves, uh, you have a DB master, uh, a queue system, you have uh, uh, document uh, databases, mail and shared I.O., those kind of things. And this is still what we consider a simple architecture. So before you know it, you end up with a lot of components like a load balancer, um, the web server, memcache, Redis, uh, MongoDB, Solar, uh, GMN, Bash, MySQL, and, and so on, and so on, and so on. So a very simple application all of a sudden becomes a really complex architecture underneath it. Are you ready for these complex things? Because, yeah, what do you do? I need to update my, my, my databases. So, okay, I'm going to provision this, but we have multiple databases. Who are we going to uh, take out? Who are we going to keep in place? And how are we going to switch this? So it's going to be a very long road before you actually get to the point, OK, we're ready for deployments. But let's look at the platform now. We have mo a web server, monitoring, databases, storage workers, caches, those kind of things. There are automation tools for that. So if you haven't heard of these uh, yet, it's uh, good that you go outside and, and, and look them up because these tools help you 
to provision the uh, system the way that you want it. Uh, the most simple approach would be you use Bash, which is, yeah, the, everyone knows a little bit of Bash. Um, easy to set things up like MySQL databases, MongoDB the, uh, servers. You can have a provisioner like Ansible, Puppet, or Chef, and really provision your system in such a way that you push a button and out rolls a new platform. You can automate things with Thing or Ant. Use Capistrano for deployments. Vagrants. Uh, someone here in the room not using Vagrants? Oh, still a few. Well, Vagrant is a configuration that you can have on your laptop and all you have to do is vagrant up and beyond vagrant a whole system comes out like a web server database and all that and all you have to do is vagrant up and don't have to worry about anything then you have virtual box or VMware or Xen um, these are virtualization platforms often used also by vagrant to launch everything and then last but not least, Docker. Um, why do we automate this? Well, every application that you have, every infrastructure that you want to use for that application has specific requirements. So, user, you might have different requirements than uh, that sir over there. And even though you both need a web server, you both need a database. The requirements could be completely different about how many databases, how many web servers, do you need a proxy in front of it, uh, do we need caches underneath it, those kind of things. So it should be optimized for running your application. And you can always update and tweak the whole process of automating um, the platform as you go along. Um, and with the optimization, you're setting an, up, um, an architecture in a consistent way for production, for staging, for testing and development. So all the developers in your team will automatically get a similar environment that you would have in production or on testing or on staging. And therefore, you can ease out all the, 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 the little quirks that you have Oh, it works on my machine, and it fails in production. And of course, you need to choose wisely. I mean, uh, tools like Puppet and Chef, they require a learning curve. Uh, some people are more fan of uh, Puppets, others are more of Chef. Maybe Ansible could be a uh, solution. So you need to choose and, and figure things out. But once you have made a decision, stick with it, because it will go a very long way. Who's using Docker at this point? OK. For those who didn't raise their hands, go check it out. Um, it requires no virtualization software. I mean, they um, released also now a native client for uh, Windows and for uh, um, Mac, yeah. So y you can run now containers on your machine, and these containers can do one thing very well. Either you set up a web server or a database, or you build a complete application inside a container. It's all depending on what are your requirements. So you can save a lot on resources, because if you have a distributed architecture in virtualization on your laptop, yeah, chances are that your whole system will go very slow because it's consuming all the resources. And with the distributed architecture, you have the same environment as in production. So if you have multiple web servers, you will have experience the same um, challenges like you would do in production. What about shared uh, sessions and those kind of things? So, yeah. Try to docker out. That's all I can say. It's, it's very easy to learn. Um, and once you got the hang of it, you're going to love it. I can promise you that. 
So what we do is we vagrant up, and then depending on what you, uh, you have chosen, you uh, uh, launch your application inf uh, platform, and you're ready to go, whether it's on your development box, testing, staging, or in production. So your development, because that's the next step. You have your source code, you have your static files, the differences, uh, the changes for your uh, databases, and so on, and so on, and so on. You hopefully manage this in an SEM. An SEM, version control system, or whatever you want to call it. And these are the most common ones. Um, if you don't use it, it's about time to get started, because working in a team, you need to have these kind of tools just to get moving. And people laugh when I show this picture, but I, yeah, there you go. Um, I do come to places where people still use FTP and file directories as their version system. So if you do this, stop today and have a look at the, these tools the moment you get back to in the office, all right? Um, one of the, the workflows in, 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 in development is you have the, the Git uh, workflow. So your developers work privately. They, when they're ready, they put it in public. And once everything is ready, uh, integration manager pulls everything in, runs uh, some uh, arbitrary tests, and push everything up into a blessed repository. Um, who's working in this way? Yeah, yeah. OK, there are other ways, but this is a very common one. And basically, it allows you to scale infinitely. So with the integration manager pushing everything in the blessed repository, and this is where the work should end, in my perspective. Because with continuous integration, it monitors uh, continuously uh, the blessed repository. When there is a pull request or a push from the integration manager, um, it already runs all the tests that are being required. And when the uh, blessed repository is updated, uh, CI will uh, pick it up, executes directly, and provides immediate feedback when something goes wrong or when he's completed his job. And you can have a whole bunch of post-development processes that can be executed as well. So have a look at those tools. One of the scenarios that we use is a pre-built step. So we stop the crons, queues, workers. We remove our target that we want to update from the load balancer. Then we have our build steps. With PHP, we don't actually build, but we use uh, the term. So we check out the new uh, changes. We have our tests. We have provisioned the target, provisioned the databases. And then the post-build step, we warm up the caches, reactivate the crons, queues, and workers, put the target back in the load balancer, and then send the status out. So this all happens after everything is integrated. These are the manual steps that most of the developers do when they have a release event. So now this system takes care of exactly the same thing and will deploy this immediately. So common CI systems, Jenkins, Bamboo, uh, Team City. And if you don't want to set up something on your premise, Look on the online systems. You have CodeShip, Semaphore, Circle CI, Travis CI, Continuous PHP, PHP CI. So, and this is just a small grasp of all the CI systems out there. Um, so, yeah, there's no excuse basically to not automate these kind of things. And I think Travis CI is the most common one because I see a lot of GitHub projects tied to Travis CI. Um, so the moment you have a pull request, it automatically starts 
verifying the pull request before it actually gets into the repository, and it works. And if you want to have some additional um, value, you can have a tool like Code Climate or Essential Labs Insight that will do a more deeper inspection of your code as you go along. And then you can integrate it with Bitbucket, GitHub, or your Git system that you host on your own uh, premise. So Jenkins, it runs all your tests, gives you a nice dashboard. Um, CodeChip, same thing. Uh, Code Climate will do the test and some deep inspections. And continuous PHP says, okay, we just execute and this is the, how far we are. And um, maybe you, you are aware, or maybe you're, done, you're not, uh, Bitbucket has a integration system for their own uh, CI platform. So you can hook up your uh, Bitbucket projects immediately onto the uh, Atlassian uh, API for doing the continuous integration. So if you have projects on Bitbucket, um, you might as well activate it. It's very simple. So we talked about the provisioning of your platform. We talked about managing your code with CI, uh, with uh, SEM and CI for automation. Now we need to fit the pieces together. So we have the PHP pipeline. The pipeline is basically steps that we define for our CI system to execute. So an example could be we have our unit tests, we do some metrics, we provision a new target, we provision databases, and we provision workers. And then when everything is done, we have our integration test. And when everything is checked out, we move it to a new branch. So we promote the branch. And this promotion can be OK, we run it on a staging or acceptance uh, platform, or we move it into production. So you can have immediately feedback when, for instance, the unit tests fail. When the unit tests fail, the process stops, and the feedback is returned. It failed on these parts. So you're never putting something in production what is broken. And you can combine these. So you have go through a um, provisioning stage, and then it promotes to uh, acceptance. And then you run it again and promote it to production. Just how you want to configure these things. Because when we are able to automate all these parts, we can actually talk about continuous deployment or continuous delivery. Continuous delivery is all the way right before it gets pushed into production. When everything is agreed upon, someone physically has to say, OK, push to production. With continuous deployment, it's done automatically. You don't have to worry about anything. And I'm a fan of continuous deployment because it allows you to release multiple times a day, and you don't have to worry like, oh, I'm putting uh, some bad stuff in production. So in our setup, we used to have uh, continuous delivery first. So we had our SEM commits. Yes, we still use the version. Um, the CI system was pulling the SEM. Then we had some build feedback. Everything was pushed into a dashboard, and people actually had to say, deploy, deploy, deploy. And then it got deployed to either test, staging, or production. So yeah, it was working very well until the manager was not available. So we had a whole bunch of things waiting to be deployed. And yeah, what we don't want to have is a backlog of things that need to be deployed because, yeah, you get conflicts and, and things get old. So we removed it. 
So we now we commit, CI is taken care of, it executes the delivery, it does the provisioning, and puts everything on the test environment, puts everything in staging because it runs the, the test on, on the test environment and on staging. Uh, we have a good feel about this, and then uh, two days later, it's automatically pushed into production. And we can override it saying, okay, uh, we're good, we can deploy right now. That's the only difference. So now we can release 20 times a day and don't have to worry about something being broken because all the code is live. We start a new project, we basically wrap it in a application management uh, entity, get feature, my awesome feature is complete, and then we have the application feature being presented. So as long as it's not complete or not allowed or whatever, um, nobody sees the new feature. But everyone can already work with the new feature code which is pretty, pretty awesome. So why do we use this platform as well? Well, for A-B testing. So we can have multiple platforms where we deploy on, and we do little changes, tweaks on one of the platforms. And then we can see, okay, what is more performant? What gives us better results? Can we upgrade to the latest PHP version? Those kind of things. Um, we can also do partial based rollouts, geolocation, based on age or gender. Um, we can unlock um, software as a service premium features whenever we want. Um, if you're into training, we have automated assisted training programs running this way. Um, it's already been mentioned, the Netflix Chaos Monkey. Anyone not familiar with that? Okay. Um, Netflix built a tool f to test the resilience of their platform. So Netflix, a uh, company that delivers movies, and they do this globally, so they really need to test their platform. Their platform um, is running on AWS systems, so they have multiple zones and regions. Um, so the Netflix Chaos Monkey, the tool that they have, um, says, okay, this zone, yeah, West uh, Europe, let's take it out and let's see what happens. And the beauty is it runs in during office hours. So if something really goes wrong, you have a whole bunch of engineers that can intervene. But the way that it's testing these things is to see how well your application is equipped against disasters. So your database is knocked out. Your caches have been corrupted. Your MongoDB cluster is vanished. Those kind of things is what this tool does. And it does that on production systems during office hours, just to see how well you build your application. And every time you run it, there's always a lesson, a lesson that you will take out of it oh, I have forgot to do something like load balancing my database connections or putting uh, multiple clusters of my MongoDB, those kinds of stuff. And if you like pranks like me, um, yeah, April Fool's Day, that's my day of fun. So we can actually have little gimmicks for the office. So for the IP of the office, we display like a random web application instead of the uh, original one. Freak everyone out, those kind of things. I mean, yeah, we're still developers, but we like to laugh, right? Um, the goal of all this is to have a focus, not management, not the business. You, as a developer, focus on what you know best. Focus on the things that you love to do, which is development. And the benefits is, well, I'm traveling a lot, so I don't get to sit in the office and 
uh, do my releases from a nice environment with all my team members present. Sometimes I'm in sunny California, sometimes in a hotel room, sometimes I'm behind uh, the wheel of my car. Uh, I'm not computing and driving, uh, just to make sure that you don't get that wrong. So, yeah, I get a call, put my car on the parking lot, and then open up my laptop and start working there. But the nice thing is, is that I can commit, and the CI system says, oh, you fixed something, I run my test, the tests have been approved, let's put it in production. So I can deploy everywhere I am. So if you have followed me on Twitter, um, you will see uh, images of me working on the beach, um, in a park, somewhere at a pool. I'm a digital nomad. The world is my working space. And I don't have to worry that I break something because I have the tools in place that make it happen for me. Um, and I can release everywhere in the world. The only thing I need to do is to be in an airplane and do a release on 30,000 feet in the air. It just sounds cool. Um, but failures do happen. And the nice thing about this infrastructure is the moment it fails, you will get a notification. And the notification is very rapidly. So the unit test at some point failed. We get a notification immediately. We get the details on, in our CI about what has failed. We fix the problem. We commit again, runs again, and then back to normal. And we move along. So. It really, really is a fast process. So the moment it fails, it stops the whole procedure. It stops right there. And you don't have to worry, oh, I broke something in production. No. You can have to take the time, fix the problem, and re-release it again. And this allows us to yeah, release over 20 times a day. The tools that we use at this point we have Subversion. Yes, we're still old school. Uh, Jenkins. We provision everything uh, using Vagrant. Uh, we use Puppet uh, scripts for the, the, the provisioning. Um, but we're migrating towards Docker. So we don't actually need to have provisioning anymore. And uh, everything is run off uh, VirtualBox. And um, the dashboard for RCI is attached to Fabricator. Uh, if you don't know, it's um, like the GitHub or Bitbucket dashboards, but uh, uh, something you can run on your own premise. Um, we connect everything through Jabber and Slack, and that's it. That's our de deployment platform. So, in my opinion, it's your turn now. If it's not coding, it should be automated. Everything you do after your commit is something you need to write down, because that is something you need to automate. And these are repeatable and reliable processes. In the beginning, yes, you will do a lot of tweaking, because it's an unfamiliar step. But all the steps that you do in a normal release are the steps that you will need to put down on that piece of paper. Because all these steps are going to be automated. An approach that I promote, and with me a lot of others, is fail first. So if a condition is not met, block it, stop it. Make sure that everyone is aware that something has gone wrong. Don't wait until the end. If your unit test fail, there is an option that you can say, stop on error, stop on failure. Use that. Put it on true. The moment it fails, it needs to stop. It doesn't have to execute everything until the end and then return. The sooner you are aware something is broken, the better it is for fixing things. So if it hurts, do it more frequently. And 
one of the things that I see is in a development team, I see a whole bunch of developers sitting behind their desk, putting earbuds in their um, ears, and there's no conversation. So when something is re being released, it's the same attitude. With a CI system, the CI system is basically our TV cook who says every single step that's going on. Yeah, you watch these TV cooks, and, and they break the eggs. Oh, I'm breaking eggs. Oh, I'm whisking the, 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 the dough. It's exactly the same thing that CI does. CI is your chef cook that says, now I'm doing this, now I'm doing that. So everyone in the team is aware what's going on. And yeah, because it's a process that you have automated, it allows continuous tweaking. Just like people here in the conference organization, they've done conferences before, and they want to improve each other conference every a little bit here, a little bit there. That's continuous tweaking. Same thing goes for your deployment procedures. Tweak here, tweak there, and you're good. So, if you want to know more, there's this book, Continuous Delivery. Um, I can really recommend it. It's from the Martin Fowler series. Um, it gives you a little bit more insight on several techniques that you can apply. So, if you are interested, please read it. And my message to you is keep calm and release more. We offer training services on this, but I'm not here to promote my business. The slides will be available on join in. If you're there, leave some feedback. If you like it, thank you. If not, say how I can improve it so I can apply the continuous improvements on my slides as well. Questions? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, one thing that's always missed in such lectures is the tools for database migrations. That's I'm always the case. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat again? The database migration tools. Yes. Um, okay, database migration tools. Um, there are several tools out there. We prefer to use DB Deploy. DB Deploy works with a system where you have incremental deltas for each change, and when uh, something is broken, you can have like an undo statement, so you can revert back to the previous stage. So let's say you have a table, and you want to add a new field. All you have to do is say, um, yeah, um, alter table, add field, blah, 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 and then remove fields uh, in the undo statement. And you have these tools, and the moment that you have it, uh, uh, a list of changes that you have, you run DB deploy, and it will say the last delta was 24, and I'm going to run 25 up to until uh, 30, which is your last uh, delta, and it does that automatically. Okay, and that's your recommendation to use this tool. Well, there are several tools out there. Uh, I don't know them by heart, uh, but yeah, just look at. Uh, database migration tools, um, and you will get like a list. We prefer to use DB Deploy because it's easy and it works pretty, um, pretty simple. Everyone can understand the, the procedure. Okay, one more question. Jenkins 2 is available, which yeah. is not CI, but CD. Yeah. Any? I didn't have time to, to uh, go in depth uh, on that, so I'm sorry. I cannot answer that. Thank you. Hey. Uh, 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 we have someone that can answer that question. <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, my name, hi. Is, my name is also you made a great presentation. Also, um, we are very big fans of automation and we have almost everything implemented in our project. Yeah. And I have two questions. First, 
How much time or execution time of your, I say, uh, production pipeline? Yeah. And second question, do you think it's possible to implement and to believe in pipeline in order to deploy in production on every single project? Okay. Um, the, the execution time for the pipeline in production, um, in our case, and depending on which project, is somewhere between 15 minutes up until like 30 minutes. Um, because all the hard tests and integration tests, acceptance tests, are done on the acceptance platform. And acceptance and production are similar systems. So once we have done that, our production pipeline is a lot shorter. And therefore, it still goes through arbitrary uh, controls. And when is it done? It's, uh, yeah, it's deployed. Yeah, so um, for your second question, um, do all these, uh, and the, the question was, do all these pipelines need to be the same? The answer is no. Um, is it possible without automatization of every single component? Yes. Yeah, it is possible. I mean, you automate the things that you want and you leave out the things that you don't want. Okay? I know you're using DB Deploy. Um, somebody asked for the alternative. It's liquid based, one of the possibilities. But two questions for you. Uh, first is do you think it is better to use the undoing DB Deploy, which is kind of working? or treat every change as a move forward. So if you're dropping an index after you added it, it's a new migration instead of an undo. Um, I have, and this is per personal, this is a personal question, uh, a pers personal answer. Um, I believe that there is no going back. So if something is broken, we move forward. Yeah. Uh, the reason why we have the undo statements is when we are in test environments. So for us, it's easy to say, OK, let's execute this. Oh, I did something wrong. Let's revert it back to the previous stage. It's more uh, for the developers to say, is this going to be a good fit? Oh, OK. Once we go beyond development, so testing doesn't go backwards. No. Uh, acceptance, staging is not going backwards. Production is definitely not going backwards. You have to think about, especially for production, the moment that you make a database change, um, the, the web servers and, and, and the information income intake is continuous. So the moment you put something in production, it's being used. So there is, at that point, no going back. So you need to create ways to figure out how to move forward. If you made a, a change and you, it's critical, yeah, you need to drop everything and, and put everything in, uh, okay, thanks. Uh, second question was, how do you deal with uh, long database migrations? Do you do a failover, switch out, or what are your options? Um, basically, we, we have uh, multiple systems. And um, depending on how many we have available, we take one out of a load balancing system, or we take two out of a load balancing system, and we provision simultaneously put them up, and then take the others one down. So again, this can be part of a pipeline. So you do a provisioning of A, provisioning of B, and how you define this is yeah, based on your situation. Excellent. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. So you had a piece of code that said, if this feature is complete, show it to the user. Uh, isn't that something that should sit on the on a feature branch? So you merge it into production, or how would that? Uh, OK, so about that uh, old code is live thing. Um, for us, we don't use feature branches anymore. It, it was a pain to maintain in the past. And when we are rethinking about it, we go like, no, we don't want that. Uh, so all the code that we have that needs to be in production is available in every branch. So we can have uh, a, a developer working on a uh, bug fix. It has the latest features already. Uh, we have someone that works on a new addition. Oh, it also has those features. So every code, piece of code is live. It's only not activated. 
that's the only thing. Thank you. Yeah? No more questions? Well, that's it. Thank you all, and enjoy the conference. <laughs>